Check one, check one, two, three. Hey everybody, it's Michael Helms, also known as Michael the Sound Guy, and this is the Location Sound Podcast. You know, each episode we talk with location sound mixers, boom ops, and other industry pros about the various aspects of recording sound on location, whether it's for feature and independent films, TV commercials, interviews, any time where dialogue from actors is recorded. I started my career in the recording studios in New York City with some of the big artists back in the day, and later on projects for networks like HBO, Sci-Fi Channel, and the Cartoon Network. As time went by, I got out of the studio and began working in production sound. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, thanks for joining us. My guest today has worked as a production sound mixer on shows like Fear Factor, Discovery's Naked and Afraid, and National Geographic's Ice Holes and Filthy Riches. Please welcome Jimmy Seiska. Thanks for having me, Michael. Now, Jimmy, you've worked in some extreme environmental conditions in your career, so what's in your audio bag when you're on location for a show like Ice Holes? Uh, Ice Holes was a really interesting uh, show. That was with Nat Geo in um, 2014. So that, that show took place in Maine, uh, New Hampshire, and uh, Minnesota. And we were recording in as cold as uh, negative 40 degree Fahrenheit. Oh, Yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a horse of a different color, to put it that way. Um, that particular show, I was using uh, Sound Devices a 788 and all Electrosonics for wireless. And what was really interesting about that is because obviously it was uh, such cold, frigid weather, uh, all located out on frozen lakes around the United States because it was uh, an ice, uh, ice fishing competition. You know, obviously we ran into a lot of problems miking people because they have to provide themselves with the right warmth and clothing. So miking people was a bit of a nightmare because the mics would just get buried underneath all of the clothing. And then if you left it exposed, well, guess what? Then it's going to be exposed to the elements, wind, water, snow, etc. So there was a lot of booming and the wireless was predominantly kind of used as a, as a safety and then on top of that, as um, some mixers may know that have wor worked in um, really frigid cold weather, all of your batteries go, go really, really quick. So what I did with that was, um, thankfully, production had provided us with um, hand warmers. I remember I, I, I myself, I was using about 10 to 15 hand warmers at any given time just on my body. Wow. The, yeah, the hand warmers would go in my cargo pants. They'd go in my regular pockets. They'd go in my gloves. They would go in the pockets of my shirt underneath my jacket from my chest to keep my core warm. And then I just started to realize that the batteries kept going. And I was like, well, what the hell is going on with these batteries? So I did a bit of research and figured that all out because I had never, I've only, at that point, I had only worked in, you know, moderately, you know, warm conditions. I hadn't moved to Asia yet and experienced all of that. So I hadn't worked in cold weather like that before. And I realized if I, there was like sticky tape to the uh, hand warmer. So what I would do is I would just bundle up all my batteries in my rig, which made my rig exponentially heavier. Yeah. And I would just wrap hand warmers around it. And it was a night and day difference in terms of conserving battery power and being able to get those batteries in the show and max them out with uh, you know, a good amount of time versus just dying as quickly as they were before I actually discovered that. So, um, you know, like any job, you're always constantly learning. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing this. You're, you're definitely learning every time you're on set. I saw your article on, in Rycoat, which was a yeah. fab fabulous article, great bio. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you had, uh, at one time, I guess you were using Electrosonics primarily, and then you switched over to Wizzycom? Yes. Um, so I was, I was using Electrosonics probably since I started my career in 2005. And then um, around 20, well, all right, we'll back it up. So Wizzycom has a big presence in Europe and in Asia. And when I was living in Asia for five years, I started hearing this name Wizzycom. This one company wanted to hire me, and 
I asked for their gear list and they showed me this company WYSICOM and I was like, well, who the hell are these guys? You know, it sound, I thought they were just some generic company. You know, I had never heard of them and, you know, I was a bit ignorant at the time about, you know, their whole presence and whatnot. So it turns out that they had been around for, you know, a couple decades. They're, they're out of Italy and their, uh, their bread and butter was Asia and Europe. So by the time I came back to America in 2012 from living out in Asia, I started hearing all this talk about WYSICOM coming to America. And I was like, I remember them from when I was living out in the Philippines. So I started doing some research and, uh, you know, they were releasing, I believe in 2014, an ultra wideband receiver um, which covers, you know, I don't know off the top of my head, it's like 470 to 698. I don't know how many blocks that, that correlates to in, in electrosonics, but mm -hmm. it's at least six, uh, I'm guessing. But it's, it's, it's a shitload of uh, usable frequencies. At the time, I was uh, in a business with a, a buddy of mine called Noise Boys. I've, I've since gone my own way. But we decided to just buy... Uh, a bunch of different receivers and transmitters through WYSICOM, and I haven't uh, I haven't gone back to Lectros yet. I still use Lectros for my IFB and for hops and stuff like that. But when it comes to uh, talent, I, I don't I don't see a better wireless system than them right now, to be honest. Okay, yeah, I actually been using Electrosonics for years, and it comes time to make a new purchase, and I was like, okay, which, should I change? Should I switch up? So, you recommend WYSICOM? Consider it. They're also putting out, um, I just spoke with them, they're putting out a new block because obviously with all of the new coordination of blocks and frequencies, T-Mobile bought, I forgot what it was, f like 40% of the airwaves. And yeah. There's a little bit of a scramble. WYSICOM, I had just talked to them. They said they're going to be releasing uh, a new wideband block that's going to be taking up some of that bandwidth that... Um, you know, people are going to have to start moving over to or should start moving to right now. So that's that's good. They're they're on top of the change that's happening with all the, the frequency bandwidth that's getting flipped around. Okay. Now, uh, with your kit, uh, say, for ice hole still, and then you were primarily booming, you said? Just yeah, as a lot, a lot. So, and that wasn't just like a softy uh, and a mic, you know, that was a full Zeppelin, wind jammer. Uh, 20 foot pole, you know, you're out on ice, you're sliding around, it's mm. windy. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was difficult for wow. sure, for sure. And what shotgun mic did you use? Uh, we used the uh, MKH 60 and 70. Okay. Yeah. Now, in contrast, when you're, say, so your audio bag for Discovery is naked and afraid. Mm -hmm. what, what was that like? That is, um, that's a little bit more of a, a simpler profile. It's uh, Sound Devices 633, Electrosonics for the Hops, IFB, and Talent. And although that show is, is very uh, difficult, uh, challenging to say the least, in one respect, uh, we're more of a fly on the wall for that type of thing. So unless the boom is 100% necessary, uh, we just don't use it. I didn't I didn't realize that, uh, you know, whenever you're on a new job, you kind of want to just, you know, like, you want to do good, you want to do good, you want to go above and beyond until you kind of really figure out the mechanics of the show and all of that. And I remember the first episode I did, we were out on the, the edge of the beachfront where the, the beach hits the water and that was because the cast didn't want to be too far into the jungle because you have all of the different bugs and elements and whatnot. So they wanted to stay closer to the water because they weren't uh, so close to all of the elements from the jungle. And it was so, so, so windy. And I ended up booming that whole episode. But I later figured out and realized after like watching the show and all of that and talking with the producers and the other sound guys that that whole element of um, how do you say it the extraneous noise from you know the wind and all of that that all plays into the show because it mm. creates that that realistic feel to it so the additional wind on the the microphones isn't such a you know it's not it's not a film it's not going to really take away from the story right. it's it's it's, it's going to enhance it you know so i learned my lesson and also swinging the boom on that 
kind of throws them out of their bubble. We try to keep them in their bubble. So there's no discussions of food or lunch. It's break or we'll be right back. Okay. You know, um, we, 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 you know, the seasoned guys tend to not wash their clothes, you know, when we're on that, because after two or three days with those cast members, their sense, all of their senses are heightened mm. uh, exponentially. So washing your clothes and coming to set, throwing them out of their bubble, throwing a boom over their heads when it's not necessary, you know, throwing them out of their bubble. The mm. only time it's really warranted to, to throw a boom over them is basically what I do for that show is uh, we, we rig a Countryman B6 into the necklace that they're wearing. And okay. then the cable runs through the strap of the satchel that they wear, the burlap bag. And then the transmitter, which is, uh, I believe, an, they call it the SMQW, which is that waterproof electrosonics. Okay. That lives in the bag. But whenever they want to go for a swim, you know, we're going to take that off and put a dummy necklace on. And okay. then that's when we're going to boom. But otherwise, we stay completely away from it and we just let them exist in their world. Man. And then they're going through water. They're going through mud. They're, and you're, you guys are like right along with them? Man, it's like I did one in I did one in Trinidad, and I'll tell you what we would we would drive an hour and a half, then we would get to base camp. Base camp, we'd kind of get gather ourselves together and all of that. And I'm not even shitting you, Michael. We would walk two miles through the jungle. Have you ever seen Tough Mudder or know what that is? No. no. Tough Mudder are these relay races let's call it that that uh athletes join around the world and it's this highly competitive event up and through mud and you know hills and it's a relay race and you know ropes swinging all of that and i'll tell you what trinidad was exactly that it was a two mile walk from base camp to cast camp and then my day started that's when i miked so that's like you're you're just up, down, ropes, sliding. I mean, there was points where I was literally just sliding down the mountain because it was easier because I would just fall. I mean, it was it was wild. Wow. And then you know, then your day started. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, when you're miking people up, do you have any particular techniques you like to use? Do you use certain expendables? In terms of miking people and expendables, I you know I kind of have like a tackle box of different elements that I use. I primarily use um, Sankin Cost 11s for all of my miking. Mm -hmm. So for those, I have the, I think they're called the RM 11s, which are little square rubber mounts, which are really great for, you know, when you're doing dress shirts and collared shirts and stuff like that. It's got a low profile. It doesn't, it's not too obtrusive and it's not too thick and it creates a nice little air gap and barrier between your shirts so that mic can breathe a little bit. I've got vampire clips, moleskins a necessity, transport tape. But one thing that I've been doing of late that's really great is I'll get myself like, imagine maybe a quarter inch thick wide of a moleskin and then about three to four inches long. And what I do is just under that microphone capsule, I'll wrap that moleskin around it. So I'm basically thickening up that, that capsule, just below the capsule, I should say. And then on that last wrap, that last pass of that moleskin, I'll take a safety pin and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll place that safety pin into the mount, into the rig, and then close that up with moleskin again. So there's enough barrier between the safety pin and the element of the capsule so that the safety pin isn't actually knocking the right. capsule and creating any noise with metal on metal. Right. And it's also creating an air gap kind of similar to the RM11, the, the rubber mount. It's kind of the same thing. But what, what I'm using instead of sticky tape is the safety pin. And this works really, really good for reality shows where you don't usually have a clue what's going to happen. Mm. Are they bending? Are they running? Are they jumping? Are they hammering? Are they, what are they doing? You know, are they working in a kitchen? Are they working outdoors? So that safety pin is not going anywhere. So mm. as long as you give yourself enough slack on that, that cable, 
it's set it and forget it for the most part. And I've, I've had some really amazing results with that. I was actually just talking to, um, to Rycote with their development team a couple days ago. And I was showing them the rig that I made. And, and I'm not the only one by all means using it, nor was I the one that came up with it. But I was telling them about how they can incorporate maybe a, a clipping mount that has a safety pin. So it wouldn't have the same kind of security as, let's say, the moleskin tape that really isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. But imagine the kind of security you have when a shock mount locks into a boom, uh, a shotgun mic. You know, it's you got to really pull it out of there for right. it to come out. Mm. And uh, they really like the idea. And, you know, there's a couple other, like, companies. What is it? Hide a mic and right. a couple other guys that are creating kind of similar stuff. And hopefully uh, they, they like some of the ideas and they come out with something. Because the problem, the problem with the technique that I was telling you about with the moleskin is, yeah, it works until it doesn't work. So then what happens is I got to take the moleskin off. And then there's going to be residue and it's going to take time and time is money when you're on set. So you either have to have enough mics locked and loaded that you have set up for the safety pin technique, but then you also have some backups that you can just pop into a different type of rig, you know, and sometimes people don't have, you know, they're, they're new starting out in the business and they don't have that money to have those kind of backups and so a quicker, easier, efficient method is out there. It's just I'm kind of waiting for, you know, one of these guys to uh, put it out there and make it. Well, that's great. Yeah, a good tip, too, because, you know, we've all had situations where the mic, people are sweating if it's on their skin and it drops down inside their clothes. And Absolutely, and, absolutely. And then some people, if you use, like, transport or medical tape or something, they're allergic to it or, yep. you know, there's, there's always something, but... There's another there's another thing that I used to use a lot that I just don't see them anymore. The uh, the mic bras. Do you remember those? Hmm, I'm trying to remember. So it's just like it's just like imagine like a just a small elastic. It's, it's like a suspender strap, but okay. it's just for a chest. You know, for for dudes because primarily for women. You know, if they're wearing a bra, you can just go to the bra and just kind of forget about it. Um, but for men. You know, they're, they're wearing T-shirts a lot of the time. So it's like getting that on their chest with sticky tape. They're sweating. Well, you know, that's not going to work because I do a lot of adventure shows. I'm outdoors. You know, I do some film stuff, but, you know, I, I, I haven't really got into that market as, as, as well as I, as, I, as I would like to be. You know, you do a couple adventure shows and the next thing you know, you're the adventure show guy. And you're like, well, how did I get here? <laughs> you know? I haven't seen them that much lately, but um, they, they work very well for me for the most part. But imagine a strap that goes around, small, medium, large, depending on how big the, the guy is. And uh, you just load the, the mic in there. And then what I would do is I would take uh, waterproof tape, which is also a huge thing in my kit. And you would just secure that mic capsule that's in the, the mic bra with some waterproof tape and some moleskin over that. And then you just clip it on and get it right there in the middle of the chest. I haven't used them, you know, in a couple years. And actually, now that I think about it, I've been in a bunch of audio stores and I don't really see them being sold anymore. So I don't know if they kind of died out or what. Believe it or not, I got hurt on a job a couple years ago and I was actually on disability for two years. So I'm just starting to get back into work as of December. Otherwise, I hadn't wow. worked for about two and a half years. What happened? How'd you get hurt? I was on, I, I don't want to talk about the show name, but I was on a show, you know, one of these adventure shows that I do, and I actually, um, I actually had a tree fall on me, and oh my thank God my camera guy heard me um, screaming, and my camera guy, uh, Kip Robbins, he, uh, he saved my life. He followed the sound of my voice, and he... Uh, what happened was, um, you know, you have these trees in the jungle that are called widow makers. I guess that's what they call them. So it's a tree that appears to be alive, but it's actually dead. And one little touch to it and it collapses. So basically that happened. Tree fell on my chest. And what saved me uh, was I was following a game trail. And for those that don't know what a game trail is, it's obviously where, you know, animals pass. So I knew it was going to lead somewhere to water. And um, so I was following that, and uh, I got to a tree. I kind of finagled it and moved it, and boom, just like in an instant, it just fell on me. 
So I'm in the game trail, which kind of created like a, a small little burrow in the ground. So the tree didn't land completely flush on my chest. Mm. There was a little bit of give because the rest of the ground to the left and right of me was much higher. Okay. So it was basically slowly suffocating me. Oh, gosh. So I, so I tried to get the tree off me for a few moments, which felt like eternity. And I, I just didn't have enough energy or strength to do that. So I started hollering. And then the producer got to me. And she couldn't get the tree off me. So I'm just looking at her struggling, and she doesn't have enough strength. My whole left side of my body's going numb. I'm like, what's going on here? And then finally the, um, the camera guy got to me. And between the three of us, we were able to get it off just enough. And I just I tucked out and was shaved. Wow. That's an yeah. unusual accident yeah. for sure. Yeah, it was... That was that was something interesting right there. Wow. Yeah. Oh man, to to shift gears back to miking up actors and talent. What do you have any particular etiquette that you like to follow? Absolutely. Everything's going to be case by case. So, you know, for reality, you're going to be primarily working with people that are inexperienced, and I mean that in the nicest way possible. Right. These guys just aren't film stars. Unless you're getting on a second, third, fourth season or something. Then, then obviously they get it and they know the drill. But if you're starting a new season of something, which um, I've done numerous times, you have to, you know, explain to them, you know, what's going on. And basically, how I like to start it is, I always want to do the miking by my station. You know, sometimes I don't have a station. Sometimes I'm in a parking lot with my rig right there. Sometimes I actually have an area dedicated to sound. So where, wherever that may be. Um, you establish that and you communicate that with your producers. And it's really important to say, I need to see them individually. Let's stagger them wherever, you know, your little base camp is going to be. And then when they come over, hi, my name's Jimmy. I'm going to put a mic on you. I usually create some sort of banter conversation. Have you ever been mic before? Sometimes some of the cast, they've had experience in theater. So they kind of, you know, I can relate on that respect because I have a theater background as well. You try to create some sort of commonality. And you also want to keep the conversation going so it's not just awkward silence, me touching you, you know, and, and getting into your area. And as long as you keep that conversation going, you know, it tends to be a very comfortable, fast experience. If you make it awkward by not introducing yourself, talking about yourself, asking about them more importantly, well, then you're going to get yourself into some potential awkward moments. Mm. Now, if you switch over to film, most of these actors in film, they, they, they know the drill. They're texting on their phone right. and you're, you're putting it on their ankle, you're putting it on their thigh, you're putting it on their waist, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's finding the balance between does this person have experience, do they not, and whether that's true or false, I always try to keep a conversation mm -hmm. going. And it's, it's, it's case by case. Sometimes they don't want to talk. So right. you, you, you feel that out. You suss that out. They're like, okay, this guy wants to text. This guy's memorizing his lines. He's working on his intro for the show then let it be. Mm -hmm. So it's it's awareness. Have awareness, you know, have some social awareness and pick up on those cues and be personable, smile and have fun, you know? Exactly. Yeah, I always tell them exactly what I'm doing, especially when I'm behind them. Okay, I'm going to clip this pack right here. It's okay. Sure. And okay, I'm dressing the cable and and also too when I work, let's say when you're micing up a, a female, as a male, I try to always have another person present at least. Sure. You know, we're not trying to cause any issues, but let's just make sure everybody's comfortable and nobody feels Absolutely. like that. Oh, oh what? You know, especially with non-professional talent. Oh my gosh. I had this one, I was working with this attorney one time and every time I try to clip the pack, she would turn and she'd rotate yeah. back to me. And I'm like, well, I just want to clip this pack right. And she would turn. And it was, it was really kind of awkward. It's like, no, no, I just need to mount this right here. But I always tell them, okay, I'm doing this. Okay. I'm just going to take this right here. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> So communication is key. Exactly. Transparency, communication. And, you know, I, I, I try to keep it fun, you know, and not just so like serious. I mean, although, you know, it, it, again, I'm going back to it. it. It's case by case. You know, if they're not feeling the fun and all that, then you just, you just the, the number one thing is just keep it pro. Yeah. And just use your best judgment. Yeah. Especially when you're micing in a place that maybe is a little more, you know, 
intimate or something like that. You just want to make sure you don't want to make any lewd comments or some people do, you know, try to, they're trying to make it fun, but they, you know, it's almost borderline, you know, yeah, inappropriate. Questionable. Yeah, exactly. And I like to give them options. So for, for example, if it's a female, um, I, I, I like to give them options and say, okay, we can do it here. It's going to be the best if we do it here. So for example, we can go on the collar. I'd like to go on your bra and or you, you ask, for example, you would ask if you have a bra, you know, and you're not announcing it to the whole set. You know, I like to you know, establish eye contact and, you know, are you wearing a bra and keep, keep it pro. Right. You don't want to announce to everyone that we're even, even having this conversation. Right. And they usually respect that and they're like, oh, OK, they, like this guy gets it. And then from there, it's like I have a waist strap. We can go to your bra. We can go. Uh, to your thigh, we can go to your ankle. I like to give them options mm -hmm. and then let them know what, how each option is going to work before we do it. And then I let them make the decision because at the end of the day, their comfort is what's most important. You know, of course, it's the placement of the mic, but I want to make sure that they're comfortable and they're not, you know, being annoyed by some strap on their thigh, on their back, sometimes transmitter packs. If you're using a higher milliwatt, like 50 or 100 or 250 with some of the electros, you know, they can get really warm. Mm. So, you know, you have to compensate for that, maybe put some padding on it so you're not, you know, warming up their back and cooking them by the end of the day. Exactly. What's your philosophy on being overprepared? For me, I think it's, it's paramount. Um, it could be difficult, you know, lugging around all of that stuff. But for the most part, I tend to always over-prepare. And you just never know, you know, you, they might set up that, you know, um, you know we're going to be indoors all day today. And, uh, you know, we're just, we're just doing indoor shots, uh, interiors, and blah, blah, blah. So what that would tell a sound mixer is well, you don't need any zeppelins and you don't you don't need any wind jammers and you probably don't need a softy because you're going to be using a windscreen but there I, I can't even there's so many times where that's the case and then you get there and it's all switched and then if you didn't bring that stuff well guess what you know you're in a world of trouble you know the same thing goes with like uh, ankle straps waist straps thigh straps i bring them all i bring mm. them all all the mounts for the expendables, all the tape. I try to simplify how I bring everything. So I've got like a, a tackle box that I got from, you know, Home Depot, which I just, you know, has every lot of accessory that I need. It's double-sided. If it's not on one side, I flip, I flip the box over and, you know, it's just like a, a fishing tackle box and I've got everything I need. Because if, if you find yourself where you didn't bring all of that stuff and you're out in the field... You know, good luck trying to make it work without your bits and bobs that you should have brought. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when it comes to renting gear and owning gear, when do you rent? When do you buy? I think it's time to buy when you realize that doing sound is what you want to do for a living. A lot of people come out of college and, you know, they, you know, my experience with filmmaking, going to college, and then also teaching college for three years out in Asia is a lot of people go into film school thinking they're going to be the next director uh, or DP. And then what they realize is how competitive that is and that they should probably try out other avenues just to get into the film world. And then maybe, just maybe, you really don't want to be a director. Maybe you just want to be a gaffer. Maybe you just want to be a sound guy. So where I've had teachers in the past say, oh, well, you should just go to college and study one thing, I took the opposite approach and I did a little bit of everything. And I figured out really early on in college that no one wanted to do sound, but it was literally the most important thing of the whole piece. You can have beautiful pictures all day long, but if you have crap sound, well, then you don't have beautiful pictures anymore. When I first started out, I didn't, I didn't really realize that you could, you know, buy and, you know, charge a kit rental. I, I didn't know that whole thing started when I was, you know, in my early, early 20s. And um, what I started to figure out is production started asking me, okay, well, what gear do you have? And there was this like light switch, like, okay, if I start investing in gear, then not only can I get labor, but I can also be a, a, a rental house and, you know, make potentially double the amount of money. 
So I guess the point when you think you should be buying gear is when you really want to take sound for a living and you're not just maybe doing it to get into the film world or you're you're just kind of trying it out and start out small you know having the best gear possible but not knowing how to use it i mean it's as good as having the worst gear mm. so start out small do your research and build it up gradually and that's what you do. You know, you get on a job and they say, hey, do you have locket boxes? Yeah, I have locket boxes. You don't have them. You either rent them and then you'll make money off of the rental fee that you're going to be renting to the production. They don't need to know that you're renting them from someone else. You get that additional $25 a week or every couple of days for the locket boxes that you're quote unquote providing. And now you're you're getting extra cash which now allows you to stop renting those, return mm. them, and actually buy your own. Mm. So guess what? The next project you're on, now you could you could say, yeah, I do have locket boxes, and I don't have to worry about renting them and providing them. And it's finding that balance. For me, whenever a production asks me, hey, do you have this? Well, even if I don't have it, I'm going to do my best to source it and put, put that into the package. And sometimes... Sometimes I'm doing that for free, you know, you know what I mean? Like they're already giving me four or five, six hundred dollars for for a gear rental. You know, they want a time code slate, you know, or something like that. Use your best judgment. You don't want to be giving away your, your gear for free. But if you're getting a competitive rate already and they ask for something kind of small, that goes a long way, especially like for a show that I'm on right now. That's a six month show. I mean, you can't be nickel and diming a company that's going to be giving you a paycheck for six months right. because it's just unheard of in this business to get on a show for six months. Mm. It's few and far in between. So you got to really pick your battles. But you also like going back to, you know, renting gear is like you don't want to give it away for free. So make sure that you're checking with other sound mixers. Make sure that you're you're going to different message boards and you're – you know, what I do is I'll, I'll like to get quotes from dif different rental houses. If I don't have an idea of what something's being rented for, I'm going to get a quote from a rental house and I'm going to figure out what they're doing and then I'm going to match that. You know, start there. Right. You know, don't give the stuff away. But when it comes to really long shows like that, I like to throw in some stuff here and there because they, they just – they're getting a better value, you right. know, and you don't want to undermine them, especially if they're giving you half a year's worth of work. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, speaking of time code boxes, do you have a preference that you like working with say, compared to another one? I just use the, uh, the ACL 204s. What I like about those um, is you have the actual time code uh, on the side okay. of the locket box. So once you jam it, you don't have to necessarily go into sub menu like for a 788 you don't have to go into the jam menu and actually see whether or not that time code stamp is syncing up with the locket box and your um and your recording device you actually get that numerical time stamp boom right on the side of it now i've i've seen like I, what is it like the bento box I, I um and there's a couple other lower profile um locket boxes that i i just haven't gotten my hands onto just yet but i tend to just use the acl 204s they're they're small enough two batteries i mean i've gotten over 24 hours of of use with mm. them and you know they seem to just they're they're solid they're rock solid and I haven't had really any issues with them. That's great to go to, to a, a lower profile one. I've heard some really good things about Zaxcom's. Zaxcom's got a device that has some sort of Wi-Fi, so you you slap them all on the camera. So when the cameras go out of scene, you know, good for like adventure shows and whatnot. When they come back, they, they all talk to one another. Oh. So if there's any sort of drift or anything like that, not only do you have the locket, but you also have a guide track, which um, I've never gotten my hands on any Zaxcom stuff, but okay. it sounds like a pretty genius invention. Oh, yeah. So uh, out of all the projects you've worked on over the years, what would you say was your most interesting project you've done? I primarily, like I've said before, do adventure shows. But one one project that I just I really, really, really loved, it was a film Brian Singer produced in 2013 called The Taking of Deborah Logan. 
it was a horror film. But what was great about it was there was a lot of ad lib and um, kind of like off script kind of stuff because the, the whole the whole premise of the film was kind of like a fly on the wall type of thing because it's about a girl that's doing a research video uh, on dementia. So the camera kind of the, – no, the camera was a character in the, um, the film and so was the sound guy. So – I got to do some really fun, fun, you know, hands-on booming, and I didn't have to wear a bag. At the time, I had uh, my buddy McCulley uh, Flint. He was mixing. We were using a wireless boom, and it was like working on a reality show because you had to anticipate who's talking. You're watching the throat. You're watching very, very close details to see who's Who's anticipating who's going to talk next so you can get that boom over them. And the director was really impressed with me being able to stay out of the shot, me capturing all the dialogue. And I, I credit that all to all these years of you know reality TV uh, experience. And it's interesting to take it a step further, you know, trying to, to fuse reality mixing with um, – scripted tv and film it's really hard to cross over but in the, this was one of those particular situations where all of my skills working in reality helped me exponentially on that particular show because it, it was running just like a reality show no one knew who was talking and it was it was primarily there was a script but they were going off script every every scene wow. and it was just really really fun because you know, unlike reality, we did get sides every day, so we had a general idea of where were we were going to be. And I like that idea of when you're you're on a project, you kind of have an idea of what you're doing, and that's the thing that can really you know get under my skin with reality shows is you don't you just don't have a clue what you're doing mm. sometimes, and you you know staying patient and positive is really important otherwise you'll drive your you'll se- yourself crazy trying to figure everything out because a lot of the time nothing makes sense right why are we do- why are we doing it why are we doing this this doesn't make sense that's true yeah you'd like to have at least an idea of what are we yeah. doing here so. yeah i've been on shows you know where there's 10 people and it's like who are we miking well we don't <laughs> really know who we're going to mic it's like <laughs> Well, I have 10 mics. Do you want me to put them on? It's going to take some time. Do we want to sit here and think about it? Like, come on, let's let's figure it out here, you know? Like, well, we don't really know. It's like, oh gosh. Exactly. Yeah, we were talking with uh I've been talking with some other sound mixers as well and you know, there's some sets that are very collaborative. You know, they want you to help them, you know, realize their creative concept you're going to record it the best as possible to help and then there's other sets where just mic them up and record them don't talk to us communication is so so key and if you take it like a step further like i've been on i've been on sets where you know union shows and non-union shows and i I get it you know union shows you know that camera guys they're going to move the c sands and the gaffers and the grips and all of that but the way i see it is it's a collaborative effort and I like to help out any way possible. You know, doing all these shows like Naked and Afraid and all of that, I just can't sit there and watch an AC or a camera guy just dragging stuff through the jungle or whatever it is that they're doing. And if I'm not doing anything, just sit there and watch them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's upsetting when you're on some of these sh- shows like you mentioned and you just like put the mic on them, don't do anything else, just kind of whatever. It's like because... Our, our days are long enough as it is, and if it's something as simple as moving a cable or moving a stand, and if you establish that and they're cool with that, which I, I hope they are, you know, I don't mind doing that because if I'm just sitting there doing nothing, yeah, I might as well be helping out. It's a, it's a collaborative effort. At the end of the day, it, it only works as every, if everybody's on you know on board for the same mission. Exactly. If you're not doing that, then there's there's it's going to get disjointed, and then it's you know, problems will arise. Absolutely. What would you say was your worst on-set experience? I'm not going to name the particular show, but it was a reality show. And, you know, what happens with these reality shows is uh, they have a, a short amount of time to shoot what needs to appear to the audience as a long period of time. 
So what they want to do is they want to implement as many uh, wardrobe changes as possible and kind of run it like a film set. But and I and I mean this in the best way possible. This is what I believe. You know, some people might hate me for saying this. Ch- changing the outfit is really not going to make much of a difference. And I was on this one show where they were doing three, four, five wardrobe changes with six to eight people, and I'm oh. the only guy. Wow. And this is definitely not anything that we talked about prior to like shooting this. Like, that's a big, big thing to kind of leave out when you're. And you know what? I learned something because that's, you know, shame on me for not actually asking, hey, by the way, are you planning on doing four wardrobe changes a day? And, you know, shame on me for not asking that at the, at, at, um, at the time, but anyone that's listening, you know, the stupidest question is the question that was never asked. You know, mm-hmm. that's the stupidest question. And I should have asked because, you know, maybe I would have negotiated then a, a, a higher rate and I'd have a very good argument um, for asking for that higher rate. So this particular show was requesting six to eight people, uh, as many as, uh, four to six changes a day, you know, you do the math, six people, let's say six changes, that's 36 changes. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's expendables increases, uh, time, um, all the different wardrobes that you're not seeing prior because it's a reality show. It's just it's just the cast member bringing whatever was in their closet to set. There's no wardrobe department saying, hey, Jimmy, do you want to come over here and check out and rig up all the wardrobes with mics and stuff? No, there's none of that mm-hmm. because the person that you're going to mic up literally just went in their closet and brought a pile of stuff and they're approving it mm. right there on the fly. So... That particular show was a nightmare, a complete nightmare, because it was like, take it off, put it on, take it off, put it on, take it off, put it on. And it was hard, man. It was hard. And different different materials and adjustments to mics. Yeah, female, male, shorts. Uh, sometimes they didn't have shirts. Ah, I'm not going to wear a shirt for this one. Well, that's news to me. (laughs) You know, and, and I got the producer like, hey, do you got a necklace, Mike? And it's like, no, I don't have a necklace mic, actually. But if you would have mentioned, I don't know, a few weeks ago, do I have one or could I out- outfit the production with one? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been great to know. But no, I cannot make a necklace mic appear right now. No. <laughs> no. So I had to end up booming the guy the whole, di- the whole day because he didn't want to wear a shirt, you know, and he didn't have a hat. You know, if he had a hat, maybe you can mic the hat. Yeah. But then that creates a whole other thing, too. You know, maybe the pack gets too warm. Maybe the the hat's kind of flimsy, so the transmitter's moving all over the place. And, yeah, there's variables. It's this, this whole game is about variables, staying calm, keeping that smile going, and just, you know, I, I think I said in the, the Right Code interview a couple years back that miking people is, like, the hardest math problem you've ever had to try and figure out and you have to do it in 30 seconds time i think i said something along the lines of that because that's what it is that's Mm. how i see it at least yeah everybody's waiting and uh you got to get it done quick and it's got to work yeah hurry up and wait hurry Mm. up and wait and then boom it's got to happen now it's like i've been sitting here for a half an hour already but now we need to have them mic'd in 30 seconds and not just one person but five it's like oh gosh (laughs) so what would you say was your biggest technical challenge on set I would say working in New York City. I would say uh, currently, right now, this particular show that I'm working on, we're having two locations for each episode minimum, eight episodes, 16 locations all throughout New Jersey, upstate New York, and primarily Manhattan and Brooklyn. Okay. No prior location scouting, okay? Well, Jimmy, you got WYSIWYGOM, so you got Wideband and all that. It's like, well, yeah, but uh, I'm also using Lectrosonics Block 19 and 21 for my hops and IFB. So that's kind of the lower end, you know, what is that, 486 to like 510 and then 537. Someone that knows all these frequencies is going to be like, this guy's an idiot. But I think it's like (laughs) 537 to 560 for Block 21. So that's kind of my bread and butter, 530 to 560 with the wideband in New York. 
But coordinating my talent mics with having those hops and uh, IFBs on the lower side of the bandwidth is is tricky. Mm. So I've been having to use some of the higher uh, frequencies that aren't necessarily as is clean. And man, it has been really difficult trying to avoid you know intermodulation and just range issues. You know, there's cert- there's a couple spots in Brooklyn that we work at that are amazing, and then we have this one place, uh, this one restaurant that they're building. You know, it's it's on the corner of of Canal Street. It's a completely open parking lot, so you don't you don't have the comfort of having buildings mm. being inside a building, kind of deflecting some of that RF from the TV stations. I'm basically just an antenna beacon in the middle of this open parking lot and it's a construction site. So there's walkies and then we have walkies and then there's, I don't know how many cell phones with all these construction guys. And it's, it's been a complete nightmare. And, you know, I'm getting as little with uh, some of the transmitters is, you know, eight to 10 feet of range. Wow. And it's, you know, I got to be on top of them sometimes and then, you know, you, you don't get the time that you need to uh, go through your system because every location, you got to do a rescan. Obviously, mm. I'm taking notes at every location, which frequencies are good, which are bad, which to avoid, which to stay on. But you still got to do a dummy chuck, even if you have a whole list of frequencies, because it changes. It changes every day. Mm. You never know. You know, we pulled up to the location a couple of weeks ago, and I see a sound guy 150 yards away from where we're filming. And I'm like, oh God. So like on top of everything else, he's right across the street. Like, what is he using, you know? Mm. And that the look that location was already tricky enough in itself. So I just wish that any production in general really just gave the the time to sound guys to go through all the processes because they think if they they hurry everything up on the the beginning of the day that this is going to somehow get them through the day. And what they don't realize is if they don't give enough time, things are going to be overlooked. Things aren't going to be checked properly. And then you're going to create hiccups throughout the day, which are going to take more time than if you just gave ample time to the start of the day. And I just, I feel like there's a disconnect from sound guys to production and then you throw in the whole element of, um, you know, we're going to shoot two cameras. And if it's like a film, uh, not to get off track, but sometimes I've been seeing films are shooting with two cameras. We're going to do the wide and we're going to do the close up in one. And it's like, all right, well, you're effectively killing the boom for every scene now, yeah. just so you know that because you're shooting your wides with your close up. So I feel like all of this money that productions try to save on time on shooting multi cameras and all of that, they're not factoring in how important sound is, how expensive it can be in on the back end with ADR and all that if you're doing a film. And I feel like that disconnect, there needs to be more communication because if there's that, if we streamline that communication, not only can sound guys, sound girls, wh- whoever you may be, not only can you get the job done better, you're going to save a lot of money and time on the back end, you know, if you, there's proper planning, whether it be a reality show or a film. When it comes to, you know, we always like to try to be as prepared as possible, but did you ever forget equipment? The only thing that comes to mind, I had, this is slightly off topic, but I had to rent some wireless a couple of weeks ago. I was doing this really high-end documentary for Duran Duran. I had all my kit rented out, uh, my WYSIWYGs on some international show. I had a friend who's a production manager pitch that I had these wideband transmitters and receivers and they would be great internationally, which is totally true. So he got me a really good rental on it. I wasn't working and, um, you know, those went out overseas. So I get this call. My buddy's coming in from London, and he's like, oh, we're doing this documentary with Duran Duran. I'm like, okay. So I had to scramble to rent some wireless. I got the wireless the day before, and shame on me for not checking. So the first thing I notice is he pulls them out of his trunk, and they're not like – they're just like schlepped around in the trunk, and they're they're not in a bag or, you know, nothing. Mm. 
And I was like, oh, wow, he, that doesn't look like he's really taking care of those. But whatever, I'm in a hurry. Give me the, give me the wireless and I'll deal with it later. So I kind of just took a glance at him. And then the next day, we're, sh- we're shooting with the bass player and singer of Duran Duran on top of the Capitol Records building in Los Angeles with... Uh, He's the producer for like Lady Gaga. He's kind of this younger dude, Brian Ronston or something. So he, I didn't know who he was, but he's this massive, massive producer, uh, music producer. And they're doing an interview. So I pull out the wireless and what I had overlooked the day before was the antenna was hanging on a limb oh, no. and it snapped. Uh. And I'm, I'm like, what am I going to do? And I called this. I called the guy up that I rented. I'm like, "Yo, dude, like you gave me some pretty wonky antennas, and you know he gave me some shit. Like, what did you do? Blah blah blah." I'm like, "Dude, forget about this debate. I will pay you whatever it is. You need to come here and get me an antenna. I am about to roll in 15 minutes." So I had to do half the interview with him <laughs> with the transmitter on. With no antenna, which gave me like, I don't know, like a foot and a half of reach. And I had to boom the rest of it, which thankfully they weren't doing like a walk and talk. And then the antenna got there. And um, the point of that long tangent was was I always have backup antennas, Mm. but I didn't have my kit. Right. You know, with my whizzies, I have doubles of antennas for all my transmitters. But because this wasn't my kit... (laughs) One, I didn't think to ask, and two, I, I just, yeah. So I got screwed there for a moment. That was that was quite a panic. In, in regards to, like, just kind of forgetting, I, yeah, I worked with this Oscar winner, Greg Curta, when I was living out in the Philippines. He's a Foley, He was a Foley mixer, he's production mixer. He did Wind Talkers, Godfather, Wayne's World, Days of Thunder. Didn't he do the hunt for Red October, too? Yes, he did. Yeah, he did the Foley for that. He just told me, just bring all your shit, man. Just bring it, bring it, bring it. And, you know, I, I was when I was out in the Philippines, I was 25 to 31. I didn't know shit. I, I thought I knew everything. And I met him, and I was like, this guy is amazing. Funny dude, great man. Uh, and he just taught me a lot of tricks. And, you know, it uh, taught me not to take the job too seriously, but take it very seriously, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Do it with a smile and just over over prepare and expect for the worst, you know. And I've just I've just implemented that. So I guess I've you know forgotten some stuff. I just I can't really recall what that may have been, you know, because I kind of just always have a bunch of stuff with me in my kit. Anytime you have, like you said, just uh, some redundant gear to solve your issue if you break down. So that's some good stories there. Now, after the production's finished, we always have backups. How long do you keep your backups? I keep them for at least six months. It's it's usually a lot longer than that because Mm -hmm. nowadays you can get a hard drive. I mean, I think I just got a two terabyte hard drive for a hundred dollars or less on Amazon the other day. And you know, to be honest, you know, if you're working and whatnot, if you're not investing in in media like that to back this stuff up, you're not playing the game smart. You know. Mm -hmm. It happened to me two weeks ago. I got a day player on this particular show I'm on right now. I'm out in Los Angeles. I'm recently married. I'm hanging out with my wife. And I get a phone call like or an email. We don't we don't have Bruce's Love. It, you know, it did Bruce's Love, you didn't record it. And I'm like, wait, what day was this? And they're like, you know, at such and such place, Bruce, they they were doing a walk and talk, and I'm like, Hundred percent had it. I like. I remember the guy. I remember miking him, because we're working with different people all day long. It turns out whatever happened when what I do is I download the audio to my personal stuff before I give it to production. Mm-hmm. Whether or not that's the right thing to do or not, I tend to have my laptop on set. If I've got like you know they have a lot of media coming in, audio doesn't take a long time to download. Right. So sometimes they don't get to it the first day because they got to get them camera cards done and they take a lot longer. So I'll take that card home. I'll make sure I get a copy of it. Then I'll give it to them. I'll create a sound report, etc. So between me giving them the card and then the card being dumped on their files and being shipped to Los Angeles 
for whatever reason, the only track not transferred was this one track, Bruce, mm. you know? So I'm telling them in the email, I'm like, no, no, I recorded it. I'm listening to it right now. And they're like, we don't have it. I'm like, all right, great. We're not going to argue anymore about whether or not you have it. I'm going to just resend it to you and resend it to him because that was the main thing of that entire shoot day. It was two people. It was basically setting up the whole episode like, hi, I'm here to do this job for you. What are your needs? Well, these are my needs, blah, 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 blah. So if we didn't have that, like that whole what we call like the intake day where they discuss and go over the project, like we just wouldn't have had it and we would have had to redo it. And it wouldn't have been cheap and it would have been a nightmare. And that was all thankfully to me backing backing it up prior to giving it to anybody. Mm. And I don't know where I got that from or how I learned that. I didn't have any horror stories of not doing that. It was just like, as soon as, because I started with like Nagras and, and the Fostec PD3, which was DAT tape. Mm. So like doing a backup of that, like, well, you're going to sit there in real time and do a backup? Yeah. Like, no. But once it switched to digital really early on, I was like, yeah, I don't know about this. So I'm, I'm going to do some backups here. So I, I just really early on, boom, back it up, back it up, back it up, make a copy, make a copy. That's good. For those of our listeners that are, say, just getting started in the industry, uh, do you have any freelance tips for them? I've got an interesting story. So I move out to Los Angeles in 2005. I went to school to be an actor. I got into sound because I saw that pivotal, important production crew is the sound guy. He's interfacing with directors and actors all day long. I can get a crash course in, you know, how set etiquette, you know, meet the right people, rub the right shoulders, and maybe I can launch my acting career through doing sound. So I've done some acting and it has helped not to get off t topic at all. So it, it, it has worked out in my favor in terms of the whole acting thing because I still do a little bit of acting as well. But um, I was at a party and I just was talking to some dude and he's like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I, I do sound and, uh, you know, I do a little bit of acting. He's like, oh, you're a sound guy. All right. Well, uh, my name's Malibu. I don't even remember his real name. He's like, my, my name's Malibu. I'm a camera guy. You seem like a cool dude. Here's this email. Email this lady in one month's time. Tell her you know me, and we'll get you a job at doing audio mixing. I don't have any gear. I just moved to L.A. I'm like, I am so green, it's not even funny. Like, green's just coming out of my ears. <laughs> it's all over my face. And I'm is that I was at this dead end like job. It was a post house where I was just answering phones, photocopying, doing dubs, patch bays, scratch removal. It's like, Jimmy, can we give you another thing to do? It was it was unbelievable. And I was just sitting there in Santa Monica defeated and I was like, Oh wait, that guy Malibu. So I emailed the girl and I said, Hey, uh, I do audio and um, you know, Malibu, blah blah blah. I don't have any equipment, blah blah blah. She, I'm 22 at the time. She emails me right back. She's like, uh, I can only pay you 350 a day. We'll provide the equipment. Can you start tomorrow? This is in 2005. I'm 22 years old. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, please. Let's do this. So I guess the takeaway there is uh, you got to put yourself out there. You got to put yourself out there. You know, I come from, uh, I'm an only child, single parent. My mom raised me. You know, from a very early age, I had to adapt and overcome and I had to communicate and make friends because I was always by myself. My mom was working three jobs. So my skill set is, is communicating with people. I can, I can own a room and communicate with anybody. You know, if it's a celebrity, if it's, you know, a, a student, a child, like... I don't have a hard time connecting mm -hmm. and you got to put yourself out there. You know, sound guys that I've, I don't work a lot with sound guys, but when I do, uh, I, what I notice is they're, they're a bit more removed. They're a bit more mm -hmm. introverted. They're a bit like, I'm going to sit at my cart and be over here. And that's fine. That's fine. But you're not going to get the, the same growth as someone that's putting themselves out there and communicating and, you know, putting themselves out on the line, you know, and just, yeah. this is what I do. This is how I can help you, you know, networking. Absolutely. You know? 
Now, when it comes to getting paid, do you try to get 50% up front, or how does it work for, for some of the bigger jobs you do? Um, so it kind of depends. Whenever I ask for uh, uh, any sort of percentage of the money up front, that's typically going to be like a commercial type thing, kind of a one, two day type thing okay. where, and it's also going to be with a client that I, I may be wary of or that I haven't worked with before. I, I'll try to extract some of that um, early, uh, front money just because I don't have a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't mind saying that as well. It's like, Hey, you know, we, we haven't worked together. Uh, you know, this is the first time working together. I'm giving you a pretty friendly rate. I, I would like to ask for, you know, 50% up front, blah, blah, blah. And typically that goes well. People really respond to honesty and, 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 and forwardness, you know, and mm -hmm. communication. Um, people don't respond to, uh, you know, one or two days into the shoot, Hey, by the way, I'm going to need the 50%. Like people don't <laughs> respond to that. You know, right. you got to you got to be up front and, and and tell them what you want. But typically I I I don't really ask for any money up front. A lot of the stuff I do is network. Uh it's reliable. Um and whenever I typically ask for money up front, it's usually if I'm a bit weary or it's a new client or it's not a major network. It's kind of this one-off infomercial type thing or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's good. So uh, regarding, you did some teaching and you've taught students in audio. Yeah. What are some common rookie problems that you see over and over again? Boom techniques. I think when I was teaching, um, there was a lot of like lazy, you know, boom techniques. And, you know, if you if you use the, the, the right boom techniques and stance, uh, shoulders, legs arms kind of all shoulder a little bit uh, wider than shoulder width apart and you keep your back straight you know you don't you don't uh, try and like angle the boom and like rest it like on your chest if you, if you if you use the right kind of techniques you're actually gonna be able to get through the day a lot a lot better and what I seen with a lot of the kids was, you know, they were just kind of using kind of a, a, a laissez-faire, so to speak, uh, approach to booming. So that was kind of hard teaching them. It's also, uh, you know, muscles that you don't use a lot. So it is hard for people that aren't used to doing it. So, you know, it's, it's getting that core uh, strength and also your shoulders and arm. I, I'm not a huge guy. I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty skinny by uh, men's standards, to be honest. But if you, uh, you know, you do push-ups and you, you practice and all of that, you'll get that core strength built up in your shoulders. And, uh, you know, that'll alleviate a lot of uh, the, the pain and all of that when you're, you're booming for a long time. Another thing was uh, teaching people how to, when I was teaching, teaching people how to mic, that's always kind of like a... a a mind bender for them because there's just so many variables and you really, you really can't learn it until you've done it and then you've done it and you've done it and you've messed it up. And there's, there's literally no right or wrong answer. You know, there's, there's a, there's a road map, but you can always take the high or the low road or whatever it may be because there's, there's always a potential better system. So, you know, you'd show the students one one technique and then they'd get it in their head that that's the only technique. And it's like, well, y yes and no. And then that would confuse them and they would trip them up. So I, I think the hardest thing, um, booming in, in mic placement, um, because for rookies and, and people that are green, they, they think that it's just like you put it on and it's going to sound amazing. Right. And they don't put in the fact that the material changes and um, maybe uh, the, 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 clothing, the clothing material changes or uh, you have to hide the transmitter somewhere else. So then you had to hide the cable somewhere else and maybe they don't have a shirt on. You got to put it in the hat. There's just there's an exponential amount of variables that, you know, you have to be really quick on your toes. I used to tell all my students you have to. Uh, you have to be like a ninja. You have to be very uh, precise and, and quiet and quick on your feet. You got to be like a sound ninja. The kids seem to respond to that. 
very well. Yes. So uh, how has the the business changed since you started? So my my biggest thing with um, this whole digital thing is this. This goes for camera and this goes for sound. And I've said this in the Right Code interview and I used to say this all the time in my classes that I used to teach. You know, everything going digital has been like a, a blessing and a curse because – Take, for example, in the 60s, the 70s, even the 80s, because I remember in the 80s, everybody had a camera. Everybody had a camera, you know. Everybody knew how to load film into a camera. Everybody knew what an f-stop was. Everybody knew what a flash was, you know. And now what, what, what I'm seeing is, you know, nobody knows where they're going because they're relying on GPS, uh, nobody knows how the fundamentals of a camera, depth of field, aperture, lighting, all of this out the window. And then the same thing with sound. We're going away from uh, mixing and we're getting more into tracking. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it too because a lot of the reality shows, they, they, don't, they don't give you the opportunity to, to actually create a mix. And now... You know, you have auto mix functions on these recorders that are, you know, they're they're pretty they're pretty good, man. They're pretty good. So, what's happening now is, you know, I started on a Nagra, and I had to figure out, you know, two three different mics going to, you know, quarter inch tape, and you'd have to actually create a mix, otherwise you're just gonna have a mess. Mm. So that whole concept. It's kind of getting removed and people are bypassing it. I'll give you another example. When I went to film school, uh, we shot on film. So we got 100 feet. We had a film or 200 feet. We knew in 16 millimeter, I don't remember it anymore, but at the time, you know, we would have to calculate how many, it's kind of noise in the background, sorry. But we would have to calculate how many minutes of footage you would get in 100 or 200 feet of film. Then we had to figure out how long our film had to be. So then we had to storyboard and figure out how many shots that we could get and how long those shots could be, our close-up, medium, and wide. And we had to do that whole process because you only had, you know, X amount of, uh, of, of film. And same thing went with the, the quarter-inch tape. Like, you had to have some on standby. You had to know if you were running... Uh, at you know 7.5 or 15 inches per second you had to figure you had to know how much time that was because you see it spinning but you also have to be aware of the amount of time that's going by because you're gonna have to do a change and it may be mid take mm. and, and nowadays it's set it forget it hit record four gigs later right it just rolls over by itself onto a new onto a new take so my biggest problem with the change is we're getting away from learning the fundamentals of filmmaking. Anybody can get an audio equipment now. Anybody can, you know, get a Zoom recorder. You got a time code Zoom recorder now that I think I read the uh, what did they call it? The F eight. Yes. I think I think the old one was like a thousand bucks or eight eight ninety nine, or you could at least get it for eight ninety nine now. That's a time code eight track, I believe recording device right it's, it's, it's insane it's insane so what's happening now is the market's being saturated john doe over there did this whole thing for 300 so guess what this time around we're going to do it for 250 all in oh. and it's 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 creating a lot of discrepancies and a lot of lower rates so you know up and comers that are are listening you know you're not going to come out the gates, you know, charging six to eight hundred for labor and, and, and four to four hundred to a thousand a day for gear. But be aware when you start growing with bigger productions and bigger stuff and bigger shoots that you have to also be firm with your rates and bring those up as well. Because what's happening is is the market's getting saturated and everybody's rates are going down. The work is becoming harder work, longer hours, more miking, more talent, more microphones, and it's becoming a bit of a mess, to be honest. Yes, times definitely have changed. Quick, very quick. Yeah. If some of our listeners wanted to get into location sound, what would you recommend they do? 
I would start uh, at ground zero, which is um, colleges, universities, film schools. There, you know, print out a piece of paper, put your name on the board. You know, I'm sure there's, you know, we're getting into this digital era and people probably aren't using, you know, cork boards and stuff like that. Get on a message board for the school. Craigslist. You know, we talked briefly about me going out to the Philippines for five years and me teaching. I found that job on Craigslist. I know everybody likes to bash Craigslist and a lot of it is for upcoming, um, you know, rookies or, uh, you know, newbies or short films and et cetera. But I mean, you know, that was some of the best years of my life. And I found that job on Craigslist. I looked under Las Vegas. I was living in Los Angeles and I said, screw it. I'll look under Las Vegas. And it says sound mixer needed to teach odd production sound recording in the Philippines. And I said, yes. And you know, I did it. So start small, dream big. And you know, look at the different sites, staff me up, uh, Craigslist, Mandy, um, talk with actors, go to uh, acting studios. Y- you got to network. You got to put yourself out there. You know, I didn't get to where I'm at and I'm sure no mixer or, or any professional didn't get to where they were at by sitting around and doing nothing. You have to be proactive. You got to communicate. And nowadays with, uh, with the internet and all of that, it's just like, you're dialed in like there's no reason why you can't put yourself out there you know the resources are there but they're they're not going to do it for you you got to you got to make them work for yourself exactly well jimmy as we kind of wrap things up or do you have any final words of wisdom you can share with the audience i think the number one thing you know if you're you want to be in the film business uh, whether it's a sound mixer or whatever capacity it is in the filmmaking process is um, the number one thing is have a good attitude. If you don't have a good attitude, things are going to go bad really quick, really quick. Show up to set, have a smile, enjoy yourself, because at the end of the day, it may be hard work. It may be long hours. It may be a project that you're not really into. Whenever I'm I'm having those kind of dark thoughts, like, oh man, why am I doing this? I, I reflect at the fact that all these people I know about, they're just sitting in an office. They've been at some cubicle job for 30 years, 20 years. They're selling a product that they don't care about or anything like that. And I'm out on a beach or I'm in New York City or I'm on a frozen lake freezing to death. You know what I mean? These people are paying me to experience things that I would otherwise never experience in my entire life. And if you, you take a moment to reflect that, whether or not you're, you're into the project or not, you're creating memories, experiences, and life lessons that, you know, you're not going to be learning sitting in a cubicle answering phones. So put yourself out there, enjoy yourself, and, uh, you know, come to set with a smile, regardless of what, what you're working on. Because you know what? The best thing about our, our business, you could be working on the worst project ever. And this is what I always tell myself is I don't have to be here for 30 years. Maybe I'm here three weeks. Maybe I'm here three months. Guess what? I could quit right now if I really don't agree with this project. Right. You know, and I can just go on to another one and, and meet a whole new bunch of people. And, you know, people get stuck in their these nine to five jobs and they're working with the same people that they don't like and they don't get along with. And they're just, it's a vicious circle. And the best part about our job is the fact that If we don't agree with someone or we don't get along with someone, guess what? We don't have to go on the next show with them. We just go on another one. Stay stay positive. Keep your head down. You know, come with a smile and move on to the next one if it's not working out. That's true. Well, Jimmy, thanks for talking with us today. If there's a great way to get in touch with you, how can people track you down? Yeah, sure. Uh, You can email me at jimmythesoundguy at gmail.com and uh, Instagram as well, jimmythesoundguy. And you're not really based out of anywhere, right? Are you out in L.A.? Or? Uh, I mean, I live in L.A., but to, to get work in L.A. is pretty tricky. You know, it's, it's the studio system or, you know, all the production companies, you know, they, they hire you out there. But I predominantly work overseas and around the world. So my family's in L.A. and, you know, my friends are, you know, in L.A., but I tend to work all over the place. Yeah. 
Well, great, man. Well, thanks again, Jimmy Seisko, yeah. for talking with us today. You, dude, you have some amazing stories, and we really thanks, appreciate man. you talking with us today. Thanks, Michael. And a big thanks to all of our listeners out there. If you'd like us to discuss a particular topic, please send us an email at locationsoundpodcast at gmail.com. We would love for you to subscribe and leave us a comment. We're available on Apple Podcasts and iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and on your favorite podcast app. Until next time, remember, sound is half the picture.